The body was cold and stiff, hands folded across the breast. I didn't find any blood on the ground or on the sawdust around where we found the body. The sign of dragging started east of the ladder. The man going down the ladder to the rear of the basement would not go in front of the elevator where the dragging was. A man couldn't get down that ladder with another person. It's difficult for one person to get through that scuttle hole. The back door was shut. The staple had been pulled. The lock was locked still. It was a sliding door with a bar across the door, but the bar had been taken down. It looked like the staple had been recently drawn. I was reading one of the notes to Lee with the following words. A tall black negro did this. He will try to lay it on the knight. And when I got to the word knight, Lee said, that means the night watchman. I found the handkerchief on a sawdust pile about 10 feet from the body. It was bloody, just as it is now. The trap door leading up from the basement was closed when we got there. City officer John N. Starnes was the state's next witness. He testified to reaching the factory between 5 and 6 o'clock that Sunday morning. He called up Leo Frank and asked him to come right away. Quote, he said he hadn't had any breakfast. He asked where the night watchman was. I told him it was very necessary for him to come, and if he would come, I would send an automobile for him. I didn't tell him what had happened, and he didn't ask me. When Frank arrived at the factory a few minutes later, he appeared to be nervous. He was in a trembling condition. Lee, however, was composed. It takes not over three minutes to walk from Marietta Street, at the corner of Forsyth Street, down to the factory. I chipped two places off the back door, which looked like they had bloody fingerprints. Watson adds parenthetically, let me here remind the reader that Jim Conley, a state's witness, could have been required by Leo Frank's lawyers to make the imprint of his fingers while he was on the stand. And if these finger marks had resembled those made on the back door, Frank would have gone free, and the Negro would have swung. The state, however, could not ask Leo Frank to make his fingerprints, for to have done so would have been requiring him to furnish evidence against himself. My information is that Conley's lawyer, W.M. Smith, after he had agreed with the Burns Agency to help them fix the crime on his client, went to the convict camp where Conley was working at a sentence and got his fingerprints twice. Be that as it may, Frank's attorneys dared not ask the Negro to make the fingerprints when they had him on the stand. You can draw your own conclusions. Burns and Lahan, narrator's note, that the crooked detectives from the Burns Detective Agency in New York City, who invented lies and bribed witnesses, and uh, uh, publisher Thomas Watson has been denouncing uh, William Burns, the detective, and his sidekick, uh, Dennis Lahan, in many articles for absolutely fraudulent and unethical behavior to try to get Leo Frank off. Back to the story. Burns and Lahan do not amount to, to anything much as detectives, but even these amateurs know something of the Bertillon system. There is no Bertillon was a Frenchman who invented fingerprinting, also filling molds of footprints to preserve them. He invented the mugshot and many other useful things for police investigations. And if those fingerprints in the back door had not been Leo Franks, Burns and Lahan would most certainly have proven that much by actual demonstration and thus put the crime on Jim Conley, or upon some other person than their client, Leo Frank. Back to the transcript. The next witness was W. W. Rogers, which is one of the police officers. He and John Black, another officer, went after Frank following Starn's telephone communication. Mrs. Frank opened the door, this is at the Frank home, and was asked if Frank was in. He came forward, partly dressed, and asked if anything had happened at the factory. No answer being returned, he inquired, Did the night watchman call up and report anything to you? Mr. Black asked him to finish dressing and accompany them to the factory and see what had happened. Frank said that he thought he dreamt in the morning about 3 a.m. about hearing the telephone ring. Witness said Frank appeared extremely nervous and called for a cup of coffee. He was rubbing his hands. When they had taken their seats in the automobile, one of the officers asked him if he knew a little girl named Mary Fagan. Frank answered, Does she work at the factory? Rogers said, I think she does. Unquote. And Frank added, 
I cannot tell whether she works there or not till I look at my payroll book. I know very few of the girls that work there. I pay them off, but I very seldom go back in the factory. There is no. In other words, he claims he was in the office most of the time. The witness spoke of Frank's conduct at the morgue, and although the purpose of taking him there was to have him view the corpse, the witness never saw Frank look at it, but did see him step away into a side room. From the morgue, the party went to the pencil factory, where Frank opened the safe, took out his time book, consulted it, and said, Yes, Mary Fagan worked here. She was here yesterday to get her pay. He said, I would tell you about the exact time she left here. My stenographer left about 12 o'clock, and a few minutes after she left, the office boy left, and Mary came in and got her pay, and she left. Watson adds, note later on that other girls were at Frank's office the same Saturday morning, and that he nevertheless fixed the exact time of the arrival of the girl he did not know. And he fixed it right. End of Watson's comment. Back to the testimony. He, Leo Frank, then wanted to see where the girl was found. Mr. Frank went around to the elevator where there was a switch box in the wall and put the switch in. He then wanted to see where the girl was found. Mr. Frank went around to the elevator where there was a switch box in the wall and put the switch in. The box was not locked. As to what Mr. Frank said about the murder, I don't know that I heard him express himself, except down in the basement. The officer showed him where the body was found, and he made the remark that it was too bad or something like that. Watson's observation, Frank was not under arrest at this time, and Newt Lee, that is the night watchman, was. Nothing as yet had been said about Conley, that is the janitor. End of Watson, back to the testimony. On cross-examination, the witness, that is the police officer, stated that, quote, we didn't know if it was a white girl or not till we rubbed the dirt from the child's face and pulled down her stocking a little bit. The tongue was not sticking out, it was wedged between her teeth. She had dirt in her eye and mouth. The cord around her neck was drawn so tight it was sunk in her flesh, and the piece of underskirt was loose over her hair. She was lying on her face with her hands folded up. One of her eyes was blackened. There were several little scratches on her face, a bruise on the left side of her head, some dry blood in her hair. There was some excrement in the elevator shaft. When we went down on the elevator, the elevator mashed it. You could smell it all around. No one could have seen the body at the morgue unless he was somewhere near me. I was inside, and Mr. Frank never came into that little room where the corpse lay. When the face was turned toward me, Mr. Frank stepped out of my vision in the direction of Mr. Giesling's, that is, the undertaker's, sleeping room. Near it is no, what Thomas Watson is pointing out here is that Leo Frank did not want to look at the dead girl or at her dead eyes. It somehow spooked him. One can speculate that Leo Frank was not a totally, completely evil person. He was a rapist and a murderer and a sexual harasser, and he was a liar. And he tried to frame two of his innocent black employees and others. But somehow he was very unnerved by seeing his uh, victim's face. He acted extremely nervous, maybe just fear of getting the death penalty. Maybe it was fear that he'd really done something wrong. And there is other evidence that he was actually quite bothered by what he'd done. And it doesn't make him a good person because he compounded his rape and murder by many lies to get innocent people to hang in his place. So it appears he was bothered, so perhaps he was not a complete psychopath. End of my comment. Back to Watson. Miss Grace Hicks testified that she worked on the second floor at the factory. Mary Fagan's machine, that is her machine where she put the little metal caps on the end of the pencils, the wooden pencil shaft, Mary Fagan's machine was right next to the dressing room. And in going to the closet, that is the water closet, that is the bathroom, the men who worked on that floor passed within two or three feet of Mary. Between the water closet of the men and of the women, there was just a partition. Now they say it was a sweatshop. You should have a nice thick wall, you'd think. Between the bathrooms for the men and women, there was less sounds. You can't hear people talking and flushing and whatnot, but the, this was a sweatshop. It was a converted hotel that was made into a very nasty pencil factory, and the Jewish people who owned it just simply didn't care about spending money on the employees or on their privacy, even in the toilet facilities. Okay, back to the story. The witness had identified the body at the morgue early Sunday morning, April 27th. I knew her by her hair. She was fair-skinned, had light hair, blue eyes, was heavily built, well-developed for her age. She weighed about 115 pounds. 
Magnolia Kennedy's hair is nearly the color of Mary Fagan's. Mary's note, as I've pointed out in previous audiobooks and articles, her hair was a unique color. It was a kind of blondish auburn, auburn being a mixture of red and brown, but this was a lot of blonde highlights in it. So it was blonde, red, and brown, all three. A unique color, and a very beautiful color. Okay, back to the story. John R. Black, the next witness for the state, testified that he went with Rogers to Frank's house. Quote, Mrs. Frank came to the door. She had on a bathrobe. I started to say that I would like to see Mr. Frank. About that time, Mr. Frank stepped out from behind a curtain. His voice was hoarse and trembling and nervous and excited. He looked to me like he was pale. He seemed nervous in handling his collar. He could not get his tie tied. He talked very rapidly in asking what had happened. He kept on insisting for a cup of coffee. When we got into the automobile, Mr. Frank wanted to know what had happened at the factory, and I asked him if he knew Mary Fagan, and told him she had been found dead in the basement. Mr. Frank said he did not know any girl by the name of Mary Fagan, and that he knew very few of the employees. In the undertaking establishment, Mr. Frank looked at her. He gave a casual glance at her and stepped aside. I couldn't say whether he saw the face of the girl or not. There was a curtain hanging near the room, and Mr. Frank stepped behind the curtain. Mr. Frank stated, as we left the undertakers, that he didn't know the girl, but he believed he had paid her off on Saturday. He thought he recognized her being at the factory Saturday by the dress she wore. At the factory, Mr. Frank took the slip out of the time clock, looked over it, and said that it had been punched correctly. That is, the slip showed that Newt Lee had punched every half hour during the night before. A Monday and Tuesday following, Mr. Frank stated that the clock had been mispunched three times. I saw Frank take it out of the clock and went with it back toward his office. When Mr. Frank was down at the police station on Monday morning, the day after the corpse was found, Mr. Rosser, a Leo Frank lawyer, and Mr. Haas, another Leo Frank lawyer, were there. Mr. Haas stated in Frank's presence that he was Frank's attorney. This was about 8 or 8.30 Monday morning. That's the first time he had counsel with him. Watson adds the observation. Observed that the Jews employed the best legal talent before the Gentiles had even suspected Frank's guilt. Why did his rich Jewish connections feel so sure of his need of eminent lawyers that they employed Rosser? Narrators note, one of the top lawyers in Georgia. Evidently on Sunday, since city lawyers did not open their offices before 8 o'clock on Monday. So what Watson is saying here is for Rosser to be there at 8 a.m. on Monday morning meant that somebody had been to see him and hired him on Sunday. So somebody thought Leo Frank was in serious trouble to have gone on a Sunday to the best lawyer in Atlanta. Back to the testimony. Mr. Frank was nervous Monday. After his release, he seemed very jovial. On Tuesday night, Frank said at the station house, there was nobody at the factory at six o'clock but Newt Lee, and that Newt Lee ought to know more about it, as it was his duty to look over the factory every 30 minutes. Watson remarks, note Frank's deliberate direction of suspicion to the, quote, tall, slim night watch, unquote, upon whom the notes had placed the crime. Frank was virtually telling the police the same thing that the notes told, that is, that Newt Lee committed the crime. End of Watson's comment. Back to the testimony. On Tuesday night, Mr. Scott and myself suggested to Mr. Frank to talk to Newt Lee. They went in a room and stayed about five or ten minutes alone. I couldn't hear enough to swear that I understood what was said. Mr. Frank said that Newt stuck to the story, that he knew nothing about it. Mr. Frank stated that Mr. Gant was there on Saturday evening and that he told Lee to let him get his shoes, but to watch him as he knew the surroundings of the office. After this conversation, Gant was arrested. Watson remarks, Observe that Frank's allusion to Gant could have had no other purpose than to direct suspicion toward him also, and that while Frank was seeking to involve two innocent men, he did not breathe a suspicion on Jim Conley, whom he knew to have been in the factory when Mary Fagan came for her pay. Back to the testimony. After the visit to the morgue, the party went to the factory where Frank got the book 
ran his finger down until he came to the name Mary Fagan, and said, Yes, this little girl worked here, and I paid her one dollar twenty yesterday. We went all over the factory. Nobody saw that blood spot that morning. Near his note, this refers to the blood spot near the toilet area near the spot where the rape and murder happened, up on the second floor, the same floor where Leo Frank's office was. Mr. Haas, as Frank's lawyer, had told witness, near his note, the police officer, John Black, to go out to Newt Lee's house and search for the clothes he had worn the week before, and the laundry, too. Frank went with them and showed them the dirty linen. Quote, I examined Newt Lee's house. I found a bloody shirt at the bottom of a clothes barrel there on Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. On redirect examination, the witness stated that Frank said after looking over the timesheet and seeing that it had not been punched correctly, that it would have given Lee an hour to have gone out to his house and back. There it is, note. In other words, for Lee to kill the girl and then go home and get rid of his bloody shirt and then come back. Watson's Evidently, Frank knew where this Negro lived and how long it required for him to go home that Saturday night and return to the factory where the girl's body lay. This new time slip gave Newt an hour unaccounted for. There it is. Note. In other words, you're supposed to punch that clock every half an hour, but there's a gap of a full hour where there's no punchings of the time clock. Uh huh. So the new time slip uh, creates the mystery. Oh, where was Newt for an hour? And Frank wants the detectives to think, aha, killed the girl, got blood all over his clothes, went home and changed his shirt, and, and ran back. That's what Frank is trying to get the cops to believe. Repeating, this new time slip gave Newt an hour unaccounted for. And in connection with the bloody shirt, the new time slip began to make the case look ugly for Newt. Quote, the tall, slim night watch, unquote, whom the writer of the notes also had accused. J.M. Gant was next put up by the state, and his evidence in substance was that he'd been shipping clerk and timekeeper at the pencil factory, and that Frank had discharged him on April 7th, Nero does note that is, fired him, for an alleged shortage of $2 in the payroll. Nero does note about $40 today. Back to the story. He had known Mary Fagan since she was a little girl, and that Frank knew her too. One Saturday afternoon, she came in the office to have her time corrected by Gant, and after Gant had gotten through with her, Mr. Frank came in and said, You seem to know Mary pretty well. After Frank was discharged, he went back to the factory on two occasions. Mr. Frank saw me both times. He made no objections to my going there. Narrator's note, in previous writings, Thomas Watson has pointed out the possibility that because Leo Frank sensed that Mr. Gant uh, knew Mary, and he had a feeling that the two liked each other. He maybe also saw Gant as a possible rival, or even as a sort of a protector or bodyguard for her, in case Frank wanted to come on blatantly to her and sexually harass her. So Watson suggests that the firing of, of John Gant could have been to get him out of the way, so that Frank could have his way with the little girl. Back to the story. 